Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to our October Missing Link guest speaker call. This is a call that we have every month in the Missing Link, where I bring in an expert in the MS industry to you guys. And I am super excited to bring Dr. Brandon Bieber to you tonight. Dr. Brandon Bieber is an MS neurologist based in California, and I absolutely love all all of the content and information that he shares. He is on YouTube, he's on Twitter, and he's constantly sharing updated information on research in many areas of MS, ranging from more holistic approaches, but also disease-modifying therapies and other drugs. So Dr. Brandon Beaver, thanks so much for being here with us today. I'm going to let you take it away. You can share a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and we'll get right into our Q&A. I'm a neurologist in Southern California and Los Angeles and South LA or Downey area. And I'm primarily a clinician. You know, I see patients and I specialize mostly in autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, but I do some general neurology as well. I cover the hospital as well. I do some Botox injections and, uh, you know, I do do some research. You know, we're working on some epidemiologic studies. We have recruited some patients into clinical trials including the ATA 188 trial. I'm actually uh, the backup examiner for that trial within Southern California Kaiser. So I know a little bit about that and um, hopefully I uh, can answer some questions for you guys. Yeah. And if you guys do have any specific questions in the chat um, or just ask in the chat, that would be fine. I did have a few people email me questions, so we'll get to those as well. But since you mentioned ATA 188, let's get started with that. So can you explain for those, and we've talked about this before in the missing link, and you and I have had a podcast episode on it. Uh, but for those that maybe haven't heard about it, can you explain what it is and what it's for? Because it's a very different approach compared to anything else that's out there so far. Very different. All of the standard disease modifying therapies we have in MS work on the immune system in some way. And this is actually a unique therapy in that it targets Epstein Barr virus. EBV, the virus which causes mononucleosis, the kissing disease that makes you sleepy. And that is well known to be one of the potential causes of MS. And we know that about 95% of adults get mono at some point, although they may not have clinical mono, they may not have the symptoms or be diagnosed with mono, but we know they've been exposed to the virus because they test positive for antibodies. But about 100% or very close to 100% in many observational studies of adults with MS show they've been exposed to the virus. And there's evidence that you actually have to get infected prior to the onset of symptoms in MS. And we can see evidence that even elevation in certain biomarkers like serum neurofilament light chain, which is a sign of injury to the central nervous system, is elevated in people who go on to develop multiple sclerosis, but only after they test positive for antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus. This was based on a famous study in the United States military that was published earlier in the year. So this is really very strong evidence that EBV is part of the cause of MS, but can we do anything about it? You know, so many people get EBV. It doesn't cause any problems. It is linked to some other autoimmune diseases and even certain forms of cancer, such as Burkitt's lymphoma. And in some areas of the world, it's actually a big problem. It can actually cause a certain type of autoimmune disease in organ transplant patients called lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, but there's no treatment for it. There's no treatment for any of these EBV related diseases that actually targets the virus. Over 50% of people get exposed to the virus by age five. And so if we were going to try to prevent the virus from infecting people, we would have to vaccinate people very early. And that's another potential strategy to potentially prevent MS. But of course, for the people in this room, you already have EBV. I already have EB. People ask me all the time, should I do a blood test for EBV? The answer is no, you already have it. It doesn't matter unless you're considering getting this treatment. And so ATA-188 is this experimental treatment developed by the drug company Ataro Biotherapeutics, and it's actually an immunotherapy. And the way that it works is they find a donor, someone who is an adult that doesn't have MS, that has been exposed to the virus. They take their T cells, 
they expose those T cells in the lab to certain antigens or portions of proteins that are in Epstein-Barr virus to sort of develop this T cell immunity against the virus. Uh, they do some safety evaluations to make sure that their immune cells are compatible with you, which is called HLA matching. In other words, making sure there won't be some unfortunate immune reaction similar to what they do with organ transplant patients. And then they transfuse the, the treatment into you, and hopefully it kills Epstein-Barr virus and somehow reduces the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So far, all we have is a small pilot study in a very small number of people. Some of them seem to have some improvement, seems to be relatively safe. There was a, one person in one of the pilot studies that actually did develop an MS relapse after getting it. Hard to say for sure if it was related to the treatment. But right now, we're actually doing a blinded randomized trial in people with progressive MS. And of course, I don't know if it's going to be effective or if it's not going to be effective. I can't say for sure that it's safe, uh, but I think it's a very interesting therapy and hopefully it will be effective and could benefit a lot of people. So do you foresee this therapy being something that people with MS will take with a disease modifying therapy? Or does it act as a disease-modifying therapy itself? How will that work? Well, I think it's a little too early to know that. So why might Epstein-Barr virus have anything to do with multiple sclerosis? It's not like multiple sclerosis is a direct infection of the brain caused by EBV. However, we know that EBV can infect B lymphocytes. So Epstein-Barr virus infects a lot of different cells. It can affect epithelial cells and the nasopharynx and cause a cold. It can cause swollen lymph nodes, but it kind of camps out in these B lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells that make antibodies. And there's some evidence that the virus may impair the regulation of those cells. It may prevent T cells from regulating the B cells, leading to the generation of autoreactive antibodies and initiating inflammation in MS. If we actually do a biopsy of a brain lesion or even an autopsy in someone who has MS and look at the white blood cells that are in the lesions, only a minority are B cells. The majority are actually T cells or parts of the innate immune system, neutrophils, macrophages, microglia. So historically, people didn't think that B cells were that important because they're the minority of the cells. I remember learning in medical school that MS is a T cell mediated disease actually, but it turns out the B cells are very important in initiating the inflammation in MS and all of the highly effective disease modifying therapies affect B cells in some way. Rituximab, Ocrevus, Casimpta, they kill the B cells. Lymtrata kills the B and T cells. The conditioning regimens in hematopoietic stem cell transplants all kill B lymphocytes. Cladribine kills B cells. So really all of the best drugs kill B cells in some way. Now, I mean, I'm kind of avoiding your question because I don't know the answer, but uh, probably I would not advise someone stop a treatment that is, that is effective. You know, but it's possible that if EBV is the underlying cause of progression in MS and relapsing MS, maybe we'll learn years later that people don't need these immune modifying therapies and they can come off of them. Uh, but, you know, probably as you're implying for the time being, it would be more of an adjunctive therapy. People would get both treatments or maybe if someone didn't think they were a good candidate for the other treatments, they would take only ATA-188. But probably I th if I thought a patient was benefiting from another drug, I wouldn't necessarily tell them to stop it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And it seems to, because it is a different approach, like it would be a good adjunct. Obviously, we don't know at this time, but I could see that working out. Is there any timeline, another hard question, is there another timeline that that you could foresee, you know, if this current trial goes well, people are continuing to show improvements, it's safe and effective. Any idea of when this might be available for people who have MS to actually take it? Well, you don't necessarily have to wait. You could consider entering the study. It's called the EMBOLD study, E-M-B-O-L-D. And if you Go to the website clinicaltrials.gov. You can type that in and find it if you think you might be a good candidate for it. Uh, there are some inclusion criteria you'd have to look at. And it is for people with progressive multiple sclerosis, even though in theory that the drug could be as effective or more effective in relapsing multiple sclerosis. 
But in terms of it actually being like an approved agent, it's probably going to be, you know, several years because generally speaking, you know, you, it, these trials are approximately two years and then there's some time to get the data and be analyzed. And generally speaking, the FDA and EMA will require two phase three trials. And so, you know, realistically, it may be something like three or four years, even best case scenario. That's sort of the bad news. Yeah, I I remember a while ago, I feel like it was maybe three or four years ago. I don't even remember what drug it was, but oh, was it clemestine that they were looking at potentially for remyelination? And I remember at the time I was living in Boston and one of the Boston MS neurologists had said, you know, if it goes well, we think it'll be on the market in three or four years, but obviously that didn't pan out. So it's not- well, well, it's on the market. Many of my patients take it. It's the old yeah. antihistamine drug Tavist. We just don't know if it works or not. You know, right. but people certainly do take it. Interestingly, uh, the person, the scientist at University of California, San Francisco is named Dr. Jonah Chan. He won this big award for doing this research. He presented that data to me when I was a multiple sclerosis fellow in 2013. You know, so that's nine years ago and it's still not proven in MS. Although a lot of the reason for it is because this is an old generic antihistamine drug similar to Benadryl. Uh, for those who aren't quite following what we're saying, this is a drug that has evidence for remyelination in mice with a demyelinating disease. And this was actually discovered in a brilliant screen. This scientist, Dr. Chan, decided that he would just take a bunch of different drugs that were already in the market and test them randomly to see if they had any remyelinating effect. And he discovered a few that did. And the one that had the strongest effect was this drug clomastine. And the dose used in the study was two tablets of 2.68 milligrams. So some people with multiple sclerosis actually take that. It's kind of sedating like Benadryl. I'm not sure if it actually works, but there are some ongoing studies. But unfortunately, this is an old drug off patent, no economic motivation for a drug company to spend you know, $100 million trying to get it to market. So that's why these things take even longer than expected. Yeah. So I love your idea of looking into the clinical trials, especially because a lot of them are still taking new people. So I know some of them are not. Uh, so it's really dependent on your area, I would imagine. It sounds like you guys are still taking people. Is that right? You know, for ATA 188, I think we're actually now not taking new people, but that's not, that's just within my organization. Uh, just the, the people investigating it, they only have so much time to do the follow-up appointments and everything like that. But, you know, you would have to, if you look on the website, clinicaltrials.gov, you may be able to find someone that's still recruiting. Yeah. If you guys haven't been to that website, it's it's a really great website. It tells you all of the active, ongoing, as well as ones that have been completed, research that's happening, who it's for, what, how the testing is being done. So it is really great. So you mentioned remyelination. So let's kind of go in that direction. What's new, if anything, with remyelination? I know that's kind of the big thing that everyone is kind of hoping for at some point. Is there any updates on that? Unfortunately, there isn't much. Uh, that video that I made about clomastine, I constantly get comments, is there anything new on this? And I have to answer that there isn't, unfortunately. It turns out that that drug clomastine, it's not the antihistamine effect that is driving the remyelination. It turns out that it's actually uh, the effect on a muscarinic receptor, totally unrelated to the fact that it's an antihistamine drug. So that has actually been proven in some basic science studies. And there are actually some other similar drugs, such as benztropine, which is used for some of the side effects of medications in Parkinson's disease. And, uh, but clomastine seemed to have the strongest effect. There was one drug that showed a lot of promise as a remyelinating agent, which was this drug called anti-lingo. Lingo is an acronym uh, for a protein that's involved in differentiation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells in the central nervous system. So oligodendrocytes are the cells that create myelin in the central nervous system. And it turns out that in the lesions in people with MS, even in people with advanced progressive MS, they have these cells. So you have this area of injury, you have the cell that is the precursor to the cell that could potentially remyelinate, but for whatever reason, they don't develop into mature oligodendrocytes and make myelin sometimes. And, you know, this was an attempt to sort of stimulate those cells into 
actually creating myelin. Uh, but it was unfortunately ineffective in a really nicely done randomized trial. So that particular drug was abandoned. There are numerous other small molecules that have been studied as potential remyelinating agents, but nothing is really far in advance, you know, like on the level of a phase three trial. So for a lot of those things, it's years away. I would say the closest thing is really clomastine. Now, people have done a lot of studies in, in lifestyle and neurogenesis, the formation of new neural tissue. And there's evidence that people who exercise have more neurogenesis, people who have a good diet, people who get adequate sleep. So there are probably a lot of lifestyle things you can do to increase your chances of remyelination. But I wouldn't say there's like a single definitively proven drug at this time. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's even if there is a drug in the future that can allow for remyelination, I imagine you would also have to have a bunch of different things. As you just mentioned, exercise, diet, good sleep, it's probably all going to come into play versus just being one thing. Do you see that being true? I definitely think that's true. One thing that's weird about MS is there isn't necessarily that high of a correlation between the number of T2 lesions on MRI scans and the amount of disability. Now, you know, some, some findings on an MRI scan, such as having so-called black holes, which are dark areas on T1, or having a lot of atrophy shrinkage of the spinal cord and the brain, those findings are more associated with tissue loss, and often people do have significant symptoms from those things. But surprisingly, a lot of people have a very impressive number of lesions, but they function well. And we think that's because there's a lot of remyelination. And on the MRI scan, based on sort of correlation between autopsy studies and MRI scans, that seems to correlate somewhat with shadow plaques, uh, where it, it would be bright on T2 sequences, but normal on T1 sequences of the MRI without associated tissue loss or atrophy. And when people look at, at autopsies, what they see is they see a lot of demyelination, but a lot of remyelination. And the remyelination may be a little bit abnormal. It may be thinner than normal. The nodes of Ranvier, the gaps, the normal gaps between myelin junctions may be closer together than normal. But for many people, the tissue seems to function very well. And I see people with very impressive amount of T2 lesion burden who have minimal symptoms. So some people seem to naturally have a superior ability to remyelinate than others, even if they have a lot of injury to the central nervous system. Why are some people lucky? Why are some people less lucky? Is it lifestyle? Is it genetics? I don't know for sure. Yeah, that's interesting because I imagine that with remyelination, there will with MS, since it is a progressive disease, there will always be demyelination occurring. So it would be important to remyelinate, even though demyelination is still happening. Yeah. And there's a lot of individual variation. You know, I have patients who are older with progressive MS, but they're relatively stable. They're not getting much worse. Whereas others have a significant worsening over time, but their MRI scans look approximately the same. Now, part of that isn't necessarily just differences in remyelination, and this can kind of transition to what you probably want to talk about next, which is there is some evidence that there is inflammation, even in older people with progressive MS, even though conventional MRI scans may look approximately the same. And it turns out that there's evidence that parts of the immune system we thought had little to do with MS. And so we think MS and other autoimmune diseases are really driven by the adaptive immune system, the part of the immune system that develops over time, that learns from viruses and bacteria and fungi that it sees and changes over time. We think that that is really the cause of autoimmune diseases, not just MS, but any autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. But it turns out that in people with MS, there's evidence of activation of parts of the innate immune system, parts of the immune system that you're born with that don't change, that don't even know that you've ever seen a virus or a vaccine in your whole life, like microglia, which are the resident macrophages of the central nervous system, and other cells and mast cells. And they actually seem to be important in people with slowly progressive MS. And people have done some fancy specialized PET scans and demonstrated some inflammation activity, even though conventional MRI looks exactly the same. And of all, a lot of our drugs don't really do anything to those cells, and they don't even enter the central nervous system. 
Yeah. Until now. <laughs> so there are these new, this new class of drugs. Well, not even new, but new to MS from my understanding, BTK inhibitors. And I first heard of BTK inhibitors a year ago. It was last October. And at the time there were three main runners in that class. And now it seems to be there's mainly just one. Can you explain what a BTK inhibitor is, why it's different, and what we should know about it? So a BTK stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And this is an enzyme involved in cell signaling in immune cells. Uh, so we won't be too technical about the cell biology. It turns out that a kinase enzyme is an enzyme that adds a phosphorus to a molecule, but that doesn't really matter. The point is this enzyme is activated and it stimulates a signal that's very complicated with a lot of different proteins and it changes the function of immune cells. So instead of killing B cells, such as you know drugs like rituximab and Ocrevus, we're sort of changing their function. And I remember uh, some you know, researchers like Dr. Aaron Boster was saying he felt more comfortable enrolling patients in these clinical trials during the peak of COVID because he thought they were safer because you're changing immune cell function instead of killing cells, probably the risk of infections is less. And I do, I do agree with that. The other benefits of these medications, like you said, is one, they're kind of smaller molecules that can get across the blood brain barrier. And they have effects not just on lymphocytes, but also these other cells uh, that may be driving this subtle inflammation. So my prediction, and I could be totally wrong, we'll see what the results of clinical trial shows, is that these drugs are probably going to be a little bit less effective than B cell depleters like Ocrevus and Casimpta in terms of preventing relapses and preventing new MRI lesions. However, for a lot of people with who are older with progressive MS, that's not really their problem. They're not really having relapses. Their MRI scans tend to look stable. It really may be this so-called smoldering inflammation, this invisible insidious inflammation that's a problem. And maybe these drugs will slow that down. Uh, so the, the drug that you're talking about that seems to be the closest to potentially getting approved is this drug tolibrutinib. And it's, there's a phase three trial in progressive multiple sclerosis called the Perseus study, P-E-R-S-E-U-S. -E and they actually had a problem where some people getting the drug had elevation of liver enzymes, and they actually temporarily paused recruitment into the trials. They didn't stop the trials because it wasn't a major safety signal. People weren't developing liver failure or anything like that, but they stopped recruitment. I'm not sure about the status currently, and I actually do have two patients in that exact trial, and they're continuing to do the trial. I don't know if they're getting the treatment or placebo. And uh, we'll see what happens. And hopefully, they'll be effective, and hopefully, they'll be relatively safe. I think that could provide an option for people with progressive MS that's safer than other drugs like the B-cell depleters or Mazent. I, I know we have a few Missing Link members who are actually part of the clinical trial as well. I'm super curious to see what happens with these studies. I remember hearing, again, it was about a year ago now, so I don't know if there's any updates, but I remember learning that they thought it might help with remyelination, potentially due to decreasing inflammation. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know. You know, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I do think that there's a lot of potential for remyelination just naturally. So maybe if you can stop some of the smoldering inflammation, you would get some improvement. You know, the thing about multiple sclerosis trials is often the outcome is something like reduced disability progression or reduced relapses. But in reality, if you look at individuals within the trial, there's a lot of variation where actually a significant number of people improve even if on average there's worsening. And so in an individual person, even with a diagnosis of progressive MS, I definitely think improvement is possible. Is that just random fluctuation or they were exercising more or the drug was particularly beneficial in that person and they got some remyelination? We can't say for sure, but I definitely think there's potential for improvement. Yeah, and another thing that it mentioned was that with BTK inhibitors, the exercise portion is going to be really important because it helps mobilize the, the cells throughout the body versus just staying in one area. So I thought that was intriguing because I've never seen that mentioned before with other disease modifying therapies.
Well, I'm not sure. I think exercise is beneficial for everyone. You know, I don't know how much BTK inhibitors are going to be like synergistic with exercise, but you know, I have a lot of patients that have a decent amount of disability and have been kind of stable for years who were able to make significant improvements with physical therapy. Like no one truly has fixed disability. Everyone has some potential for improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Any idea on timeline? Uh, last I heard, was I think they were hoping for the end of 2023. Do you think they're still on target for that or is it going to be a little bit longer? Well, whatever they say, I would take the over, but hopefully not that much. You know, maybe 2024, 2025 is more realistic. Yeah. I think the main reason I'm so excited about those two in particular is because they are different than what is currently available. There's other disease modifying therapies, as you mentioned earlier, Mazend, Maven Clad that are kind of similar, just different variations to ones that already exist. And so this just seems really exciting because it's, it has different mechanisms behind each one. Yeah. And I think that both the doctors and people with MS, you know, we get a sense that we're missing something, that our treatments are effective. You know, I can even say, and I, I know I don't look that old, but there's a big difference in what we see compared to 10 years ago. You know, a lot less patients getting admitted to the hospital with bad relapses and needing plasmapheresis. You know, a lot more people who are very stable. We may have more side effects with some of these stronger medications, but people are definitely doing better on average. But there's still people who aren't doing great. Unfortunately, we're doing the best we can. We're treating them, uh, but they still have some progression. So we definitely need to try something different. And, you know, many of these uh, clinical trials may not work out. I think both ATA-188 and this class of BTK inhibitors is promising, but hopefully something will work out. Hopefully one of these two will be, you know, a significant benefit to people with MS. Yeah, absolutely. If not both. Yeah. Ooh, two options. That'd be great. <laughs> then, then they have a choice. Uh, what about a this vaccine from Pasithea? Am I pronouncing that right? I believe you are. Yeah. So, I talked to the the one of the people who is one of the lead scientists in this study. So, Pasithea is a small pharmaceutical company. They don't have any drugs that have been brought to market. But hey, Moderna didn't have any drugs brought to market before the COVID-19 vaccine. And now, you know, they're a very valuable company and very famous and hopefully have a lot of good programs going on. Uh, I should give a slight conflict of interest statement in that the, uh, the professor who is actually involved in this, who I interviewed for my YouTube channel, Dr. Lawrence Steinman, is actually the mentor of my mentor. So I do know him a little bit. He's not paying me or anything. I don't own their stock or anything like that, but we do know each other a little bit. But anyways, uh, their vaccine is a DNA vaccine. And so it's not like the COVID-19 vaccines. And we can talk about that other study if you want to. And just to give a little bit of background on that, these vaccines, people think about vaccines in terms of stimulating the immune system and preventing illness. So a vaccine shows your body an antigen, you, show, you have a strong immune response. And then when you see the virus like COVID-19 or polio, you have greater immunity. But it turns out that response to a vaccine is very specific and requires specific elements of the vaccine to cause a strong immune response. They have to put the antigen, the portion of that protein, in a specific context. I can't exactly explain the technicalities of this, but the point is they can design a vaccine to stimulate the immune system, but they can also design a vaccine to sort of attenuate the immune system towards a particular antigen. And this has sometimes been called a reverse vaccine. Now, historically, the use of vaccines in multiple sclerosis hasn't been great. One of my uh, former mentors was Dr. Leslie P. Weiner at USC, and he had a famous T-cell vaccine study in multiple sclerosis published in the early 2000s, but it was ineffective. But there are all these little technical advances. So what they did is they engineered these plasmids, these little circles of DNA, and they encoded a certain protein called gliocam, which is a protein that's in the central nervous system. It turns out that gliocam is very similar to one of the proteins in the Epstein-Barr virus called EBNA1. And so the idea is that maybe Epstein-Barr virus is triggering multiple sclerosis by sort of what's called molecular mimicry. It kind of ramps up your immune system 
to target EBNA1, and then there's some cross-reactivity to gliocam in your central nervous system, and that sort of initiates the cascade of inflammation. So that's the protein they chose. So this vaccine is designed to attenuate your immune response to gliocam, which is one of the antigens in myelin thought to be important in multiple sclerosis. Now, the only data they have so far is an animal study. And so in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which is very different from humans with MS. So mice are not humans, obviously. EAE or experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis is not multiple sclerosis, but there are some similarities and they were able to demonstrate they could make mice better than if they gave them placebo. And it was a very significant difference. So that's very preliminary, never been used in any human with multiple sclerosis, but you know, don't ask me how, how far away we are on that one, a very long way away. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's nice to just know what's out there, even if it doesn't go anywhere, if the results are not effective. You know, I think it's helpful to just know what's, what is existing at this time. Uh, what about the other vaccines that you had mentioned? Before I answer that, I would say sometimes important because if you're interested, you could enter the clinical trial. You know, yeah. uh, at some point, they may do a phase one study and rec recruit humans and it would probably be an open label study. And so, you know, you're getting the drug and it would primarily be a safety study. They wouldn't necessarily prove that it works. But if you're interested in trying something new and contributing to the science, you know, that's always an option. How often would you suggest that someone check back to that website, the clinicaltrials.gov, to see, you know, if there is other other trials or just other openings for uh, former trials? Well, if you're really interested in entering a, a clinical trial, you could check every few months. You may hear about them from Twitter or, you know, from the National MS Society. But if you're in, really interested, you know, you could check pretty frequently because there are new ones all the time. And you could filter based on your location or based on some aspects of the inclusion criteria or whether or not it's a randomized control trial with an intervention, you know, because a lot of studies are more observational studies to learn more about the disease. But I think if you're really interested in entering a clinical trial, you can check every few months because new things develop all the time. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So yes. Vaccine. So the other one. Yeah. Uh, so this was published uh, quite a while ago, I think at some point last year. And uh, this is actually not associated with a specific pharmaceutical company, as far as I know. This was actually an academic publication. Uh, but there was a lot of press regarding the mRNA vaccines for COVID-19, you know, obviously because of COVID, and that was the first instance of using that form of a vaccine, using messenger RNA to code for a protein to cause an immune response. But a lot of scientists started trying to use that technology to develop other vaccines. And one example was this researcher, Christina Cranky, who engineered an mRNA lipid nanoparticle that encoded a different myelin antigen. So instead of gliocam, she chose something called MOG, which is myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. And this is just one of the proteins in myelin, the fatty sheath covering the nerve fibers. And it turns out that MOG has previously been identified as a potential myelin target, as a potential immune target in multiple sclerosis. And just to back up a little bit, one thing I would say about multiple sclerosis is that a lot of autoimmune diseases have specific autoimmune targets. For instance, some people with myasthenia gravis may have specific antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor in the muscle cells that's causing the disease. Multiple sclerosis, we believe, is different. We believe that it's polyclonal, which means there are multiple clones or multiple immune cells with different targets. So it's not like your immune system is targeting one thing in your myelin. It's probably targeting a lot of different things. And so that's why different proteins could potentially be used. Uh, but anyways, she used MOG, and she also had a successful study in this mouse model of MS, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Uh, so, you know, both of these vaccines could potentially be beneficial. Pasathea has the advantage in that they're already a drug company. They already own the proprietary technology, so they could start the trial much more easily, whereas, you know, an academic center, they would probably have to sell it off or work with a pharmaceutical company. And I'm not sure if there's any update on that. I haven't personally heard anything. Yeah, I hadn't either. I was curious to see if you had. 
Um, awesome. Okay. So if anyone has any questions on what we've talked about so far, again, just feel free to type them in the chat. We're going to kind of switch gears here. So there's been a lot of debate always in the MS world about diets and supplements, probiotics, vitamins. And I'm curious what research is currently saying in the more holistic realm. Have there been supplements or vitamins, et cetera, found to be beneficial or not beneficial? Well, so in terms of supplements, you know, the number one supplement I recommend is vitamin D. There's evidence that people with low levels of vitamin D are more likely to get multiple sclerosis. There's evidence if you look at people with MS, those who have lower levels of vitamin D uh, have a greater risk of relapses and new MRI lesions, uh, you know, on screening MRI scans. Now, does taking vitamin D actually improve your prognosis? No one knows for sure. Uh, actually, Cochrane's evidence-based review published a review where they claim there was really no evidence for this. If you look at the actual randomized trials, there was no clear evidence. Although they used relatively low doses of vitamin D, personally, I would recommend taking vitamin D D just in case. I personally take 5,000 international units of vitamin D3 once a day, just in case. I don't even have multiple sclerosis. It's the one vitamin that you're probably going to be deficient in, no matter how good your diet is, unless you're a lifeguard and you're out on the beach with your shirt off all day. And that is the potential confounder. And so you might ask, how is it possible that vitamin D could be so strongly linked with MS, but taking it doesn't benefit you? And the answer is that it may actually be the sun. It may be ultraviolet radiation is good for multiple sclerosis and causes both attenuation of the immune system and increases vitamin D levels. So that's the the potential confounder there. But I would advise taking it just in case, and the risk is very low. Another one you could consider taking is omega-3 fatty acid supplements. So fish oil or flaxseed oil. There's not really a specific dose. And, uh, you know, if you want to go the natural route, you can actually crush flaxseed and put it in oatmeal, which is actually what I do. And this is based on some observational evidence from the holism studies, which uh, stands for health outcomes and and people with multiple sclerosis. I'm not sure of the exact uh, uh, acronym there. And it's done by Professor George Jelinek and his crew at the University of Melbourne and their epidemiologic research, where they just look at people with multiple sclerosis and they interview them, they assess their level of disability and ask them what supplements they're taking, what their diet is like. And they found that people taking these supplements were doing better on average. Historically, he recommended fish oil, uh, but now he recommends flaxseed oil just because that seemed to be more correlated with less disability in his most recent study. Uh, Personally, I don't have a strong opinion, but I think it's reasonable to take one of those two supplements. Awesome. And what about probiotics? Well, probiotics are less proven, in my opinion. Um, the, The theory there is there's some evidence that the microbiome, the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract, are different in people with MS than in normal controls in numerous studies. The idea is that the gastrointestinal tract, even though we don't think of it as an immune organ, probably plays a significant role in autoimmune diseases. There's some research that people possibly due to antibiotics and Western diet could have a dysbiosis, sort of a dysregulation of the bacteria They could even have an overgrowth of certain fungi like candida, and that could decrease the function of the gastrointestinal tract. It could make it more permeable, so foreign antigens may get directly into the blood instead of being blocked by the sort of gut mucosa barrier. Um, You know, so uh, I think taking probiotics is, is very reasonable. There are some small pilot studies in people with multiple sclerosis, but, you know, I wouldn't say anything is definitive. People often ask me to recommend a specific product. It's hard for me to do so, but it could be beneficial. Yeah. And nutrition. This is a tough one. I feel like there's some research out there suggesting that certain types of diets are better for people with MS, but then there's other research saying that it doesn't necessarily matter, just generally, you know, low sodium, just general recommendations. Um, 
What do you know from research and also what are your thoughts? Well, you know, there's some epidemiologic evidence uh, that in countries where people eat more dairy and eat more saturated fat, there are higher rates of multiple sclerosis. So it may be better to have more of a plant-based diet, you know, eating a lot of whole fruits and vegetables. Now, of course, it's hard to say if that's because of diet or due to other confounding factors. What we do know is there are very large differences in the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in different areas of the world. Uh, for instance, in the United States, the rate of MS is about 1 in 350 to 1 in 500. We know that in Cuenca, Ecuador, the risk is only 1 in 25,000. And we know in Central Africa, the risk is extremely low. And we also know the risk seems to be increasing in certain countries, such as Mexico and India and Iran, kind of correlating with the increasing rate of other metabolic diseases associated with, with Western lifestyle, like diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. So there's like this observational evidence that something is happening in our society that's making MS more common. Of course, part of it could be low sunlight exposure. Part of it could be we're too clean. We don't get exposed to parasites when we're young, and that messes up the development of our immune system. But part of it could be diet. You know, so there's sort of that background there. There are various studies on diet and multiple sclerosis. Uh, you know, there are even randomized trials on diet and multiple sclerosis. I can't tell you about all of them, but I'll tell you about a few of them. There was one study done at Oregon Health Sciences University on a whole foods plant-based diet uh, versus placebo. And it was run by this guy named Dr. John McDougal, who's a, a proponent on the starch-based diet. And so people were eating fruits and vegetables, no processed food, no animal products. And it was a small study, and they weren't able to demonstrate less disability or less new lesions on MRI scans, but they did demonstrate uh, reduction in fatigue and improvement in quality of life and improvement in cholesterol profiles. And, you know, even that is worth fighting for. Uh, Dr. Terry Walls, who I'm sure most people here are familiar with, who herself is a doctor with multiple sclerosis who had very good results eating her diet, which is a modified paleo diet, and there are different versions of the diet. Uh, but she has actually studied her diet in a randomized controlled trial against the Swank diet. And both groups did better in terms of fatigue and quality of life. Uh, and her diet group did a little bit better than people doing the Swank diet. And she actually has an ongoing randomized trial and, uh, you know, studying her diet against an intermittent fasting type diet. And so, you know, we're getting more data on it. When I kind of look at everything in totality, I think that there's, there's definitely sufficient evidence to recommend that diet makes a difference in multiple sclerosis. You know, I personally give recommendations similar to what's recommended in the book, Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis you know, which is eating whole fruits and vegetables, seafood, avoiding processed food, avoiding dairy, avoiding sodium. Uh, and, and, you know, but I can't say that's definitively better than say, you know, the modified paleo diet recommended by Terry Walls. I, I encourage people to make any change which involves the elimination of processed food. The only diet I'm really going to criticize if you want to eat Coca-Cola and Twinkies, I would say forget about it. But, you know, I think the best bet diet, I think a whole foods plant-based diet, OMS, the modified paleo diet, all are likely much better than what most Americans are eating right now. Uh, you know, it's hard to study diet. It's hard to prove a single diet because we would really have to do a randomized controlled trial and people don't stick to diets perfectly. And of course, people are somewhat biased because they're aware of what they're eating and people have certain eating habits. So it's very hard to prove these things definitively. Yeah, I feel like diet is probably one of the hardest things to stick to, maybe along with exercise, because it requires a lot of effort to stay consistent with things like that, rather than a supplement or a drug of any kind. You just take it. It seems to be much easier. Uh, what about intermittent fasting? There was some research a few years ago uh, that people were super excited about with intermittent fasting and MS. Any updates on that? Well, so I'm not aware of any like recent updates on that. From a theoretical perspective, there's all of this evidence that fasting has various effects on the immune system. And it also causes your brain to shift in order to actually metabolize ketone bodies instead of glucose to function. 
you know, a fat a ketogenic diet has been used in other diseases such as epilepsy. It's been studied in traumatic brain injury. It has various effects on modulating the immune system. You know, one theory is that our ancestors fasted a lot just because they didn't have access to food 24 seven. So we're very adapted to fasting. I mean, certainly intermittent fasting is safe for the most part. You know, it's proven for weight loss. It may have benefits in multiple sclerosis. There's some small pilot studies that seem promising. There was a study done by a Dr. Ellen Mowry, which is a small pilot study on intermittent fasting and multiple sclerosis. And it, it seems promising. And, you know, again, I wouldn't say, you know, I can really strongly favor one diet over another. Yeah, again, I think it's it's hard to say, but again, same as we were mentioning with the uh, drug trials that are going on, it's nice to know what's out there and, and what research is saying about various options. I only have, I think, one other question for you, um, and I do see we have some questions in the chat, so then we're going to go to that. Um, my question is about neuroplasticity. So we know that neuroplasticity is uh, possible for people with MS who have brain lesions, but to my knowledge, there's very little research on the effects of neuroplasticity for spinal cord lesions. And I love asking neurologists this question in case you guys know information that I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Is there any newer research suggesting that for people with MS who have spinal cord lesions, that neuroplasticity is possible? That's a tough question. There's actually a famous neuropathologist, Dr. Bruce Trapp, who is known for his autopsy research. And he has this program where if you have multiple sclerosis, uh, you can actually enroll him in his study. And when you pass away, hopefully much later for unrelated reasons, when you're old, uh, he will actually go and get your brain. And it turns out for technical reasons, getting and preserving the brain as quickly as possible is very important. And he's done a lot of studies, you know, looking at autopsies in multiple sclerosis. And one of his findings, as I told you before, is that people with MS, even in advanced progressive multiple sclerosis, have these oligodendrocyte precursor cells. He's also one of the pathologists who really demonstrated the importance of brain lesions and the different types of cortical lesions, excuse me, the gray matter lesions. We used to think that MS was primarily a white matter disease, but the gray matter turns out to be quite important as well. We just can't see the demyelination on conventional MRI. As far as I know, those studies are primarily in the brain. So we don't have as much data in the spinal cord. My kind of experience clinically is that, you know, when people have a lot of like tissue loss, you know, the disability tends to be more irreversible. You know, for someone who has a lesion associated with a lot of atrophy on the spinal cord with tissue loss, those patients are much less likely to get better. But a lot of people with a significant T2 lesion burden on spinal cord can also function really well. And the reason is that tissue probably has a lot of demyelination and remyelination, and it functions well. And people may have intermittent symptoms. They may be susceptible to heat and exercise and infection and things like that and temporarily get worse. But I definitely think neuroplasticity is possible in the spine as well. It's just what I would say from my experience. Yeah, I have the same experience. So I completely agree with that. That's an interesting view, though, um, that makes a lot of sense that it's more about the tissue loss versus the location of the lesions, whether or not you would improve from exercise or anything helping with neuroplasticity. Yeah. And sometimes one thing that we see empirically is someone may have a big lesion and it may actually shrink on a follow-up MRI, but it sort of shrinks with atrophy. And you may think the lesion looks smaller, that must be might be good, but there could be a lot of tissue damage associated with that. You know, so the, the appearance on MRI doesn't necessarily correlate with the function of that tissue, particularly T2 bright lesions. Yeah, that's so interesting. Okay, so we're going to go through as many questions as we can with the time that we have left. And one is actually about atrophy. I think it's this most recent one. Um, so I am newly diagnosed in 2021. If you're currently on a disease-modifying therapy, does that rule out a trial? Or does the type of trial note if you can be on a disease-modifying therapy or not? And the type of MS, uh, her doctor was vague on her type, so she doesn't know. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
So for a lot of disease modifying therapies that are immunotherapies, generally speaking, being on an existing disease modifying therapy would be a contraindication. Like for example, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you know, they could potentially inhibit the immune system. They don't want to take the risk of you taking that plus another immunosuppressant. And so generally speaking, that would be a contraindication. So I'm having trouble seeing the chat. What was the second aspect of that question? Um, she doesn't know what type of MS she has. Her doctor was pretty vague. So she was wondering if that's important for a trial or not to know exactly what type you have. Well, it is important because a lot of clinical trials, they want you to have a certain subtype. Me personally, I'm actually kind of against that. And in, in my opinion, primary progressive multiple sclerosis and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis are the same disease. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I don't make the rules. So they do require a specific subtype, especially in these progressive MS trials. And then in relapsing MS trials, they'll often exclude people with any form of progressive MS. Now, it would be nice for you to know what type of MS that you have, so you know which trials to look for, but you don't necessarily need your neurologist permission. If you want, you could, you know, if you think you're a potential good candidate for a clinical trial, you could reach out to the individual sites and go get evaluated. And actually, it's actually they who determine whether or not you meet the inclusion criteria. Your neurologist really doesn't have any say. So it would be nice to know just to save you some time, but you don't absolutely need permission from your neurologist or anything. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question, do you have any recommendations to your patients to help slow down brain atrophy? Well, there are various studies that uh, disease modifying therapy can reduce brain atrophy. There are some observational studies on Tysabri, post Tysabri uh, marketing studies showing that, that there's a difference in brain atrophy between the placebo and treatment group years later. And so I think preventing new lesions and relapses is one way. You know, I probably the real question you're asking, is there anything else that you can do to prevent brain atrophy? Well, I suspect that the things that I think help multiple sclerosis overall, such as taking these nutritional supplements, having good nutrition, exercising regularly, getting adequate sleep, managing stress are likely to help with brain atrophy. There isn't as good research on that though. It turns out that everyone has brain atrophy. Even people without any neurological disease are losing roughly 0.2% of brain volume per year just with aging. People with Alzheimer's disease can have very rapid brain atrophy, losing up to 2% of their brain per year, which is terrifying, of course. Uh, but there is evidence that a lot of people with MS do not have accelerated brain atrophy, particularly if they've received highly effective disease-modifying therapies. For instance, uh, there are observational studies with Lymtrata and hematopoietic stem cell transplant years after the treatment that many people have roughly normal brain atrophy. In other words, they are having brain atrophy, but it's at roughly the rate of the general population. So it appears that you can stop brain atrophy in multiple sclerosis. Very exciting. Uh, we'll call this as our last question just because of the time, uh, but what are your thoughts on HSCT? And I feel like this is a loaded question, <laughs> but what are your thoughts on stem cell therapy? It's difficult to answer that in one question. Um, basically, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a group of different therapies. And even though it has the name stem cell in it, it's not truly a stem cell therapy in that we're not using stem cells to regrow nerve tissue. However, it is likely the most effective disease-modifying therapy in multiple sclerosis. The way that it works is chemotherapy is given to wipe out the immune system, and hematopoietic stem cells, cells that grow red and white blood cells, not mesenchymal stem cells, stem cells that could grow nerve tissue are given to replenish the immune system to prevent the major side effects of the treatment like anemia or infections. Historically, this was a very dangerous treatment. People had mortality rates around 5%, but now it's much, much less, maybe around 0.5%. Uh, it turns out the efficacy of the treatment is determined by the conditioning regimen which is the chemotherapy drugs given to wipe out the immune system. There are various different conditioning regimens that have been used. One of the more famous uh, doctors in the United States, who is actually now retired, Dr. Richard Burt, uh, 
who uh, supposedly performed the hematopoietic stem cell transplant on Selma Blair, he often used a regimen of cyclophosphamide plus antithymocyte globulin, psi plus ATG. Interestingly, that's one of the weaker regimens. It turns out that there's some observational evidence that the stronger chemotherapy regimens may actually be more effective if you follow patients out for many years. I've had a decent number of patients receive these treatments. The appeal of the treatment is a lot of people go into long-term remission. They may just be kind of stable. They you know, wouldn't need further treatments. The same thing is actually true for people who receive chemotherapy for another reason. Like for instance, they had cancer. You know, Some people with MS coincidentally get breast cancer and they get chemotherapy for that. And of course the chemotherapy wipes out their immune cells, but their MS is in remission. Uh, but I've had patients who've been stable for several years. Uh, is it everyone? Uh, no, I, unfortunately it's not. There are people who are significantly worse after uh, getting the treatment, but it can be highly effective and can induce a long-term remission. Now, you may ask, well, why don't we just do it for everyone? Well, uh, the, the rub is the potential side effects. Uh, you know, people can get infections and anemia. You know, in rare cases, people do die uh, as complications of this treatment. You know, also a lot of people with MS are young women and there's a risk of infertility with these treatments. So if you're a 25 year old and you have relatively low disability, it may be a little bit daunting to risk infertility if you want to have children someday. Are we underutilizing it because there are no pharmaceutical companies marketing it because a lot of these drugs are older and cheaper? Maybe, maybe we are, you know, uh, doing hematopoietic stem cell transplant is very complicated. It requires a team of experts. Neurologists are not qualified to administer that treatment. You know, we would need the help of hematologists. In my organization, the hematologist team, the bone marrow transplant team would not treat autoimmune diseases, as is true in, in most locations. It's yeah, the treatment of autoimmune diseases with HSCT is done at specific specialized centers who want to engage in this risky business. I think that's all, all I could give in a couple of sentences, but uh, you know, it, it is a highly effective treatment of relapsing multiple sclerosis, I would say. I think that's a, a great answer and very informative way about answering it. So that's awesome. Uh, we do have more questions in the chat, but I want to respect your time. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. I think it's so valuable to have you as a resource just to stay up to date. And again, if anything, just to have these drugs or vitamins, nutrients, supplements in the back of our minds so that when we hear them or see them, it's not our first time hearing about them. We can be more educated about making those decisions. So thank you, Dr. Beaver, so much for all of your insights and your expertise. And thank you to all Missing Link members for hopping on and such great questions. Thank you for having me on. Of course. Have a great night, everyone.